this Christmas, we want to deal with the issue of of finding hope. How do you find hope? For, for people, a lot of times, this time of year is the hardest time of the year. Do y'all realize that, that the suicide rate around the holidays actually skyrockets? You would think at a time of season where we talk about joy to the world and things like that, that everybody would have that, but everyone does not have that. And so we want to talk about how do you find this hope? And so we're going to continue in our series, Hope. The last two weeks, we dealt with the topic of hope thieves, things that want to steal your hope. But now we want to talk about what does it take to begin to cultivate that hope? Because guess what? You may not realize it, but being a hopeful person is something that you can actually cultivate. It's not something that happens by a roll of the dice, by chance, that life circumstance hits you by chance and now you got a hopeful. No, you have to become a person who's intentional about being a hopeful person if you ever want to have the real hope of Jesus Christ in you. Amen? So we are going to go ahead and go into the scriptures and then I'm going to pray and then we're going to get into this word and then I'm going to let y'all go home. Um, but I ain't got to rush because the Texans played last night one. Amen? Amen. So, oh guys, if you have your Bible, can you go ahead and open to Matthew chapter 1? Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to go to verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, 18. We wanted to do Christmas a little bit different this year. We still wanted to tell the story, but we wanted to make the story real and relevant to us in our present day life. And let me tell you this, Jesus is relevant in every part of our life. He's relevant in every part. But we wanted to make it this year. With, look, right now there's some people going through some things, and you may not know it, Everybody, look look at somebody around you. You ain't even got to say something. Just, just begin to look at some of the faces around you. And what you may not know is that every person has a story. And there's people going through some things right now that will blow your mind if you had all of the details. And you see them in church. But you don't know their story. But let me tell you, we, we need some hope this year. Amen? We're going to trust and believe Jesus Christ to bring us some hope. So if you have your Bible, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 1. Those who got it, if you want to stand with me and read, if you don't want to stand, don't stand. But we celebrate Jesus. We stand up. If we do it at the baseball game, at a football game, at a basketball game, we're going to stand up from here. And it says this, Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her, plan to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, through the Lord, through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we just come before you today and we ask that you would speak to us. God, we don't, we don't want church. We don't want a church sermon, but we want to hear from you personally and intimately. We want you to speak into our hearts, speak into our lives, speak right into the, the heartbreaking, gut-wrenching, real hard, down-to-earth truths that we go to every day. God, right now, some of us are going through things and we're feeling like broken, we're feeling shattered, we're hurt, feeling hurt, we're feeling confused, God, and we need a little hope. Show us how to walk in hope and victory, even in the midst of times of hardships. So, Lord, would you just allow your Holy Spirit to fall fresh on us? I pray your Holy Spirit will fall fresh on me today. As I speak, I pray that you would remove me out of the way and hide me behind the cross, that you would speak to your people, God, and also speak to me. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Today we're going to talk about the topic of hope in the midst of hardships. Hope in the midst of hardships. That's, I think, a, a fitting topic for us because here's the truth about life. I hear people say like this. If you're not in the middle of something, 
You either just got out of something or you're about to go into something. Let me say that again. If you're not in the middle of it, if right now things are okay, that doesn't mean that you're exempt from trials and situations and heartbreak and hardships. What it means is that you either just came out of it or you're about to go into it. So we need to be very aware that this is the place that we are. But it could be like a light switch being flipped on. Tomorrow you could be going through hell. And the truth about being a Christian is not how we live in times of peace, but it's really about how do we live in times of hardship? How do we live when the cards are dealt against us, when all of the factors are against us, when things aren't in our favor? How do we go on? Because one of the things that God did was he set apart a people for himself and he redeemed them through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And in doing so, what he wanted to do was prove to the world that my people have something different that the rest of the world does not have. So what he wants from us is the ability to live differently. We may be going through hurt. We may be going through hardships. We may be going through trials. But he wants us to look a little different, smell a little different. He wants us to be different so that when people see us, they go, what is it that you have that I don't have so that I can get what you have? And we can say, Jesus, that's what God really wants for us. And so as we get to this topic of, you know, hope in the midst of hard circumstances, I, I, had, I heard a little illustration the other day, and I wanted to go ahead and, and, and just read this little, and it says this, a man approached a Little League baseball game one afternoon. He asked a boy in the dugout what the score was. The boy responded, 18 to nothing, we're behind. Anybody ever been in one of those games before? 18 to nothing. He's like, 18 to nothing, we're behind. Boy, the spectator, the spectator said, he said, I bet you're discouraged. And the young boy said something very profound. He said, why should I be discouraged, replied the little boy. We haven't even got up to bat yet. Think about that. What I learned about hope, even in that little illustration, and what we're going to learn from the scripture today is this, is hope is not a matter of your circumstances. It's a matter of your perspective. How you view what you're going through. And what you believe it is, is going to be determined whether or not you have the ability to have hope in the midst of that situation. So we're going to go ahead and look at this text, and we're going to see it, and we're going to go from there. And we're going to go back here to Matthew chapter 1, and it says this. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. The first thing I want you to know about hardships is this true reality. Um, it is easy to lose hope in the midst of hardships. How many of y'all have ever been there at a point where you've been through something so painful, so bad, it's so disparaging that the first thing you want to do is give up? Anybody ever been there before where you've seen something, the, the, the obstacle that was in front of you was so large that you did not want to wrestle with the obstacle. You'd rather give up, give into this thing, take an alternate route, go on a detour, go around it, do anything else, even if it caused you hurt and pain, to lose. You just said, I have, there's no way I can do it. Let me tell you this, that is a very real human reaction to things that we see things that we feel like are too big for us. And so we want to give up. We don't want to fight. We want to give in. We want to find another way. But God has a plan for our lives. And the thing that we have to figure out is this. Is God trying to make me go around it or is he trying to make me go through it? Because here's the reality. Sometimes God is going to ask you to go through hardships because he wants to cultivate you to become what he wants you to become. And there's some things that can only be cultivated through pressure. Anybody know how a diamond is made? A diamond starts out as a lump of coal that is put under immense and intense pressure for long periods of time until this thing that was dusty and could just leave dark dirt all over you has now turned into something with clarity and value and is a precious thing. But it had to go under pressure first. But we got to understand that. It, yes, it's easy to lose hope. And I want you, let me, let me even go deeper than this. Let's talk about what is hope before we talk about what losing hope is. I want to give you a definition that I saw in Webster's. It said this, hope is a feeling of expectation and a desire for a certain thing to happen. That's what it means to have hope in something. It means that you have an expectation and a desire for something to happen. Here in class, one of the big problems when it comes to things like hope, having hope, and why people lose hope, people don't define their hope. You have to learn to define your hope. What is it that you actually have hope in and have hope for? Have you ever asked yourself that thing? 
Have you ever asked yourself, what is it? Because one of the things that happens is we stop having hope in God because God doesn't do some things, but we never actually define and say, what is it? Because guess what? If we actually took the time to think about what it is that we're trying to have hope in, sometimes we will realize we're actually in the midst of a hopeless situation. Let me tell you why. Because anything that you're hoping for that does not involve the power and presence of God is a hopeless situation. Are you wanting and hoping for things to happen in your life that actually are distant and set apart from God? Or are you asking God to do things that involve his activity and presence personally in your life? That's what you need to ask yourself. Because there's a lot of people, let me tell you this, there are some things you should be hopeless about. There are some things that God does not want to do for you because if he did it for you, you would have hope, but you would be destroyed at the same time. But let's go into this text. I want you to see this. I want you to think about Joseph's situation that he's in the midst of. And I want you to tell me, what kind of situation was he in? We're in this, this, Jude, this Judaic culture, right? And so in that culture, a, a couple, they didn't get engaged. They didn't date like we date today. Like we, we date, we, we go, we swipe. Is it swipe left or swipe right? Because I don't even, look, I've been married for 12 years. I don't swipe nothing. Okay, let's just keep it real. So, but you know, we got apps like Tinder. We got Match.com. We got all of this stuff. People pick and choose who they want to date. They date, they sometimes date multiple people, right? They go through this and then they make their choice and say, this is the person I'm going to marry. Some people just go to the courthouse, do it real quick. Some people fly to Vegas and do it overnight because they drunk. But we have, that's how relationships go nowadays. Let's tell the truth. A lot of people don't even want to think about marriage. But in this culture, marriage was something that was held in very high esteem. And so it was something that was involved the entire family. When a person got ready to got, get married, they didn't just say, hey, I like you. Let's go out. Let's go to the movies. Let's kick it. What they did was the entire family was involved because they had a certain culture and value system in that family. And so that family would help to arrange a marriage with another family that had the same value system and culture. I promise I'm going somewhere. So here you got Mary and you got Joseph, and they're at the point of being engaged or betrothed. And what that literally meant was their families had come together and reached an arrangement because they come from the same culture and context and value system. And so Joseph's family would give a large gift to Mary's family called a dowry as, a, as part of that pledge to Mary. And they would come to this agreement that you'll marry my daughter. Now, what they didn't do was say, we're going to get married in 90 days. Because in that culture, what a man's responsibility was to do was to prepare a home for that woman he was going to bring into that home. So that, in, that betrothal and engagement period in that culture would sometimes last around a year where he would have a year to begin to go in and to find a plot of land and begin to build a home for which he would take that woman home to. So as we come to this story, what we're looking at is a situation that somewhere in the middle of that period of betrothal, in the middle of, of this man having been committed enough that he entered into this arrangement with her family to marry her, in the middle of him doing all of the work and all of the labor and all of the things necessary to prepare a home for her, we find this man who's been working hard, preparing to bring this woman into his house, he comes and he finds out she's pregnant. I want you to view that in present day circumstances. Brother working hard, he trying to get ready to marry the girl, and all of a sudden she comes and say, I'm pregnant. What do you mean you pregnant? I'm pregnant. You pregnant, pregnant? I'm pregnant. What kind of pregnant? With possibility? I'm pregnant. That's literally, imagine if that was you and you had to have that conversation that you've been doing all the hard work. You've been going to work every day, banking your checks, check after check. You ain't going out shopping and doing all the extra stuff you want to do. You're doing all of this labor and all of this preparation just to get ready to be married and to create a home. And you've done all of this and you find out that the person that you're about to marry is pregnant. And the problem with her being pregnant is not just that she's pregnant, but that y'all didn't do anything that could have her pregnant in the first place. So imagine that predicament in Joseph's mind. Everything that his life had centered around for whatever time period this is, within that betrothal period, all of his labor, all of his hard work, everything that he was preparing for had just got thrown up in the air because he finds out that the woman who is supposed to be his wife, that he's going to come together with, form a union, have a family, raise children, and change eternity with, is now pregnant. If that was you, how would you feel if that happened to you? My guess is that while it doesn't say it, this is my sanctified imagination that as a human being, I've had my heartache before. And when you get a heartache in a relationship, I don't know if y'all ever been there, but 
I mean, it's like them ugly songs. You don't want to eat. You don't want to sleep. You don't want to drink. You don't want to do anything. Because when your heart has been broken by something, it is a devastating thing. Anybody ever been to that point where you've been devastated before? You trusted somebody and they, and they did something to violate that trust. People that you depended on all of a sudden became undependable. All of those type of things. It shatters your world. And what happens is that we begin to focus on the problems so much that all of a sudden we don't see a way that this situation can work out in our favor. And that's reality. That is why in these situations it's so easy to lose hope because we're looking at the factors. And we're not, and we're saying, guess what? The way that this is lined up in front of me, I do not see how. This can work in my favor. The loser is me. Somebody else got, and see, we don't like it when people get over on us. Can I, can I get, Darius, look, if all of us go down together, that's fine. But don't use me so that you can get up while I go down. We don't like that at all. It, you know, I know myself, if I feel like somebody's trying to get over on me, as sanctified a pastor as I want to be, there's an emotion that I can't even describe that begins to well up within me, and all of a sudden, a little bit of the old hood comes out. Do y'all know, just in my thinking, I'm looking like, and I'm like, Jesus, I remember the other week somebody did something, uh, in the last few weeks, that really just, they did something to somebody in my family, and, and, I, and I cannot lie. Y'all, you know when it's somebody in your family. You know how you get. And, and it, it was a devastating thing. And in my mind, I'm sitting there for a second, and the things that I can't say on the stage that were going through my mind, I'm looking for duck. T- Let me stop. I, I mean, that's, that's how I really felt. I'm like, you, and, and, and when we get in the midst of those situations, all kind of emotions take over and things take over, and, and we're angry, and we're focused on that thing, and we're missing a greater picture. But when we see Joseph's situation, look what he says that he's about to do. It says this, and Joseph, her husband, in verse 19, being a righteous man and wanting to disgrace, and not wanting to disgrace her, he planned to send her away secretly. The thing I like about Joseph in this is this, he still maintained his character even in the midst of hard situation. He may not have had hope, but he still had character. Let me tell you this. That's a good thing to have, that even in the midst of times where things don't look like they're working out, you still have some character in the midst of that. Because a lot of us will lose character the second we see that things aren't working out in our favor, and we'll go back to trying to manipulate the system to make things work out in our favor. And let me tell you this. God doesn't get the glory out of that. And anything we do where God doesn't get the glory is something we need to have removed from us. But what I've noticed is this. Look at him. Even in his character, he starts making plans on how he's going to rectify this situation, but at least he's trying to rectify it where she's not hurt. But look at this. Isn't that the first thing that happens when we start losing hope? We start trying to make things work. We start trying to make moves, as we like to say. We start scheming and plotting and strategizing. We start moving this thing here and moving this thing here. We're going to make something work. There's something in us that believes that we have the power to make something work. Sometimes if we actually make something work, we're going to mess something up. Anybody ever tried to make something work and the second you tried to make it work, you thought it was going to work and it backfired on you? It made the situation worse? I think that's the situation that Joseph was in. Think about what would have happened. But that's the reality, guys. When we get in these situations, we get in this point, it's easy to lose hope. And so we got to ask ourselves, you know, let's look at Joseph a little more. I want to go to the second point in this. So in order to begin to gain and cultivate a perspective of hope, let's just get from what we're losing now. So let's change our perspective. We got to understand this. In order to have hope, hope must be centered in the truth and revelation of God, or it is fragile and false. Let me say it again. In order to have truth, it must be centered in the truth and revelation of God, or it is fragile and false. Here's the reality. The reason people get so upset when hardships come in is because all of their little brittle dreams come crashing down. See, what are your dreams based on? Are your dreams based simply just on your agenda? Are your dreams based simply just on what you want? It's me and it's what I want. And this. And because let me tell you this, we get upset when what we want. Let me tell you, I don't care how old you get. When you want something that you want and you don't get it, we will jump on the floor and kick and scream and cry like little babies and spoiled brats because guess what? Some things we still haven't matured and aged in. Can I tell the truth? 
You go to the car dealership and they tell you you can't get the car that you want. Okay, you go there and you want the, 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 the Nissan Armada and they tell you you got to get the Nissan Sentra. Ain't nothing wrong with a Nissan Sentra. But you mad. You mad. You kicking and screaming. Go to another car dealership. And I can see the car salesman sitting there saying, and your credit score is still going to be 552. That ain't going to change nothing. Lucky we gave you the Sentra. Even though you had a 74% interest payment. But here's the reality. Let's just keep it real. We kick and we scream and we get mad and we get angry when we don't get our way. And so then when those things are broken, they come crashing down. Now we're angry, we're pitiful, we're crying, we're complaining, we're, we're hopeless. But real hope is not something that can be broke easily because real hope is centered on a God who cannot be destroyed, a God who cannot be broken, and a God who does not change. I want you to look in this and you're going to see something in the text right here. Let's go right here. Go to verse 20. It said, but when he had considered this, now we're having a transition. All of a sudden, remember, Joseph had been sitting there thinking, how am I going to make this right on my own? How am I going to dismiss her so she don't get put out there as the neighborhood? You know what? And then how do I get myself out of this situation so I can go find me another young lady that I can marry and just put this whole situation behind me? It says, after he considered this, what happened? An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Had Joseph's dreams simply just been relying upon, I want my house to look this way. I want my family to look this way. Let me just tell you how real we are sometimes in life. Sometimes we're the type of people, I want my, if I'm a guy, I want my wife to look this way. She better not ever put on weight. She better always look like this. Her makeup better always be done. If your wife got kids, I'm not even going to go there. If she got kids that she got to rustle and wrangle with every day. And you want to, I'm telling them, can I just tell them myself, I'm going to just preach at myself so I don't make nobody else mad. How about that? And you just want to go sit somewhere else in the house and let her deal with the kids and you don't want to do nothing. But then you expect her to have time every day to do her hair the same way. You done lost your mind. I said, I'm just preaching to myself right now. I don't mind putting myself on blast. See, we got fragile, shallow dreams and hopes and expectations. And if Joseph's dreams and expectations had been about what kind of marriage he portrayed and what kind of house, does my bride look a certain way with a certain hair color and a certain eye color? Is it 36, 24, 36? If it's like this, if that had been all that his hopes and dreams were about, then it just got broke real quickly, and he has no reason to hope. But in this story, we see something amazing happen. We see God intervene and begin to explain to Joseph that, Joseph, your, 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 your girl is pregnant. Yes, but what you're dealing with is not your everyday extraordinary, you know, extra normal situation. This is extraordinary. She has not been unfaithful to you. In fact, the contrary, she's so faithful that God looked at her and said, oh, favored one, I'm going to let the power of the spirit overshadow you and you are going to conceive and bear a son and he will save his people. You got a spectacular bride. The problem is this. Was he defining what he want? Was he hoping on something that he wanted or was he hoping on the greater glory of God? Here's a question. One of the, actually, let me say this. One of the greatest reasons that people don't have hope is because they have things that are disconnected from God that they're hoping on. What are you hoping for? See, church is, the one thing is church ain't the place to lie. Tell yourself the truth here if you can't tell nobody else. What are you hoping on? Look, I'm going to put myself out there. It's going to be on camera somewhere. And I know it. When that Powerball over one billion dollars, I spent three dollars on three tickets. <laughs> God was not connected with that thing, but I kept justifying it by saying, Lord, if I hit, I give you 40 percent. 40 percent, God, 40 percent. You have a business arrangement. Think about that. 
what are we hoping for? What is our hope? What are we putting our hope in? How is God connected with that thing or how is God disconnected from that thing? Let me tell you this. If God is disconnected from the thing and the object that you're hoping for, you should automatically lay that thing down because it's a hopeless situation. Because even if you get it, it is not something that's going to bring about the things that you need. But if it's something that God is connected with, something that is fueled by God, instituted by God, initiated by God, now you got something that you can hold on to. See, God tells us, don't, don't be dismayed, don't be saddened, and don't be afraid. I want you to stay positive and I want you to be hopeful because I'm in the midst of this. The very things that are going on right now, I'm the catalyst for them. I'm the initiator for them. I'm the instigator of them. So you just stay there and be faithful and hold on to the reality that I am God and I am able to do exceedingly and abundantly above everything you could ask or imagine. You just wanted a wife, but I'm going to make your name and your family eternal throughout the ages just because you chose to do what I need you to do. All you wanted was a nice little cottage in the Jerusalem sun, but I'm going to let your name live forever. People, when they see you, Guess what? The greatest thing you can do is not great. Why? Because when people see you know what they're going to give you credit for? Ain't you Jesus' daddy? Ain't you the one that raised Jesus? I, I, when I get to heaven, you know, one of the, that's one of the first people I want to talk to, Joseph. You know why? Because I want to ask him a question. So what was it like with Jesus as your child? Anybody ever thought about that? Like, parents, what do you do when you're trying to correct? Because y'all know sometimes as parents, we try to make up answers. Let's tell the truth. We do our best. Kids, don't stop listening to it. We do our best, and we're trying to shield y'all from some things sometimes. But sometimes we know we don't have an answer, and we're trying to make up the answer. And I just imagine Joseph going to Jesus. Well, Jesus, you do this. Joseph, son of David. <laughs> no, the answer. Like, you know that prince look? Joseph, really? But you know I know it. You know, just, I just imagine that. See, the greatest thing that Joseph would ever be known for is the very thing that he wanted to dismiss and run away from. Think about that. What things have you run away from that God wanted to do that would have changed not just the scope of your life in the present day, but the scope and trajectory of your life forever? But the thing is this, we have to understand our hope must be centered. I don't even want to use that word centered anymore. It must be anchored in Jesus. And if you can't figure out how that thing that is in your mind is connected to Jesus, well, guess what? It's not connected to Jesus. But here's the next thing. True hope cannot be found until we trust God. And I'm actually going to put the third and fourth points together because I'm just going to do this. I think they connect so well. True hope cannot be found until we, we trust God. And true hope cannot be found until we obey God. Let me put them together. True hope cannot be found until we both trust and obey. And I can't separate the two of them because guess what? One is what we say our heart is. The other is the proof that what we say we believe in our heart actually exists in our heart. Trust is, is, is that thing we say, we trust you, Jesus. We believe you, Jesus. We hope in you, Jesus. Obedience is I trust and believe in you so much that it will be the motor that propels me forward to do the very thing that I say I believe. I want you to look at this. Let's go to these last verses. 24 says this, And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. There's a couple things right here. First of all, he woke up from his sleep. Some of us need to wake up from our sleep. We need to wake up and get back to reality about who God really is. See, here's the thing. Some of us, we, we, we love God in the dream, but when we get back to real life, we don't want to love him that way. What I love about what Joseph did is he says he woke up and then he went and obeyed. Some of us need to wake up from our dreaming and then go obey God. We need to do the things that he's asking us to do, the things that we're trusting in him to do. Guys, I'm up here preaching today and I'm going to preach like I'm preaching to 2,000 people, even if it's only 27 people in the room, because I trust and believe that God is going to do something in the life of this church even when the numbers don't say it. Can you, can you look at your circumstance and say, God, I know you're connected to this thing, so even though the factors don't look favorable for me, I'm going to trust you and operate as if it's real now. 
Look what he does. It says this. He woke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. Guess what? That is the greatest sign of hope because what you're saying when you go obey God is this, God, I don't know how everything's going to work out here. I don't have to know every part of the plan. All I have to know is that you are who you say you are. You can do what you say you can do, so I'm just going to do it anyway. That's where hope is found. Hope is found in the reality that, guess what? Even though everything in the foreground is seeming like an obstacle, I see you in the background, and as long as I can fix my eyes on you, I'm going to hurt everything in the foreground that attempts to get in my way. It may trip me, and I may stumble, I might fall, but I still keep my eyes on you, and I'm pressing towards you because I believe that that's really you. See, that's the problem. When we say we don't have hope or we feel hopeless, what we're really saying is, I lost sight of Jesus. I lost sight of God. I don't see him. But let me tell you this. That's why Hebrews says, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. It means literally you have to lock on to him. You need to get your autofocus on, lock on him, let it lock in, and no matter what else is around, you fix your eyes on him. Why? Because you know that if you get to him, you will have had to pat everything else that's getting in your way. But to many of us, we're lost. We're tripping over the flower pots. We're tripping over the candles. We're falling off the stages. Guess what? Some of that stuff, you, you are going to fall over. And you are going to trip over, but God put it in your way so you could fall and trip and get up with more character than before you fell down. And that's the reality. What things is God putting you through that you want to give up for that are all a part of your cultivation and sanctification, that are a part of your training ground so that you can be what he wants you to be? The truth is, a great reason we're hopeless is because we want to be helpless. Let me say that again. We, we're hopeless because we want to be helpless. What do I mean? We really don't want God's intervention in our life. We really don't want God to put us through what he has to put us through to make us who he wants us to be. And so we would rather just hope in shallow stuff because it's easier to deal with shallow stuff than to deal with the cultivation that comes from God. But let me tell you this. If you're willing to go through hard stuff, you can become great things. The question is, Are you willing to take God with trust that he has your greatest intentions in mind and that the plan that he's placed in front of you, the path that he's placed in front of you is the path that is going to make you what you need to be? That's the greatest thing. Can we trust and obey in the midst of? And it's the very reason why God, when he wrote in the scripture, said, we walk by faith and not by sight. Today I need to ask you this. Who needs to stop looking at some stuff? Who needs to stop looking because your relationship didn't work? Because your job's not ideal? Because there's some things going on? Who needs to just put their eyes on Jesus and say, God, I'm not going to act as if this stuff doesn't exist, but I'm going to walk through this stuff looking dead to you. That's where the mark of a Christian is made. The great people in the Bible who did amazing things, when you go to places like Hebrews 11 and you look at the hall of faith, it's not people who God just took them through nothing. He had to take them through something. Noah had to go through being ridiculed and looking like a fool in front of a whole nation of people and building a large boat in the midst of the dry area until God raised up the water. Some of us need to go through some things right now. And yet they're hard and it's difficult. It hurts. It's challenging. But we need to know that guess what? The flood is coming. So let's just keep building this boat and looking at you, God. Today I want to challenge you. I don't care what it is you're going through. I don't care how bad it hurts. I don't care how high the wall is. I don't care how wide the obstacle. I don't care how big the burden You need to keep your eyes fixed on him because his word tells us that God is able to do. We don't even need to finish the sentence, but we can. Exceedingly and abundantly 
above anything we can ask. What I love this is I love one translation. It says, not just ask or think, ask or imagine. I want you to realize that God's imagination is greater than yours, which means his potential goodness for your life is greater than the greatest goodness for your life you could ever imagine. The Bible says, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Some of us, we've been fainting for too long, but we need to just wait on God. And that's where, that's where your, your faith is cultivated. That's the crux of this thing. That's the real substance of it. So my challenge for you today is this. Can you hold out looking at God? Can you hold out when your marriage isn't looking like you want it to? Can you hold out when your funds aren't looking like you want them to? Can you hold out when your emotions feel like they've been completely tapped dry and you don't have the emotional reserves to continue that? Can you look at him? Yeah, you feel like they damaged you and your damaged goods. Who cares? Guess what? God does. And he's going to see you through it and make you better. Let's just pray. Father God, we just come before you today and we ask, we believe that you are up to something in our lives. My prayer right now, oh God, is that you would give each and every person in here the strength, the resolve to keep their eyes fixed on you and to allow their optimism to come not from the situation and circumstance they're in, but from the true realities of who their God is. God, I pray during this time, this season, that people would not begin to feel hopeless looking at the situation and the circumstance, but that they would see the joy of the Lord as their strength. So God, today we just pray that in the midst of our hardships, in the midst of our heartaches, we would resolve to believe and obey. And then God, I just pray that when it's all said and done, when the story's been written and we look back at the factors and the detail. God, we just give you a praise like none other. Because you are the only way we could have made it through. It's in the mighty and matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, I pray. Amen.